Okay, I'm going to start. I expect more people will come and go, but that's okay. We're going to get going on time. Um, welcome and good evening. Thank you all for coming out in this ugly weather. Uh, at least we don't have snow, so that's good. Uh, my name is Barbara Cooper, and I'm the chair of the Fidelgo Democrats. Um, I'm going to start the meeting with an acknowledgement. We, the Fidelgo Democrats, acknowledge that we gather on indigenous land, the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Samish and Swinomish people, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. If you're not on the mailing list, um, be sure to sign in and put your email and phone number. Um, the sign-in sheet is on the back. Um, there's also tags for folks. Um, we don't tend to send out a lot of emails, so you're not going to get a whole lot of weird th stuff all the time. Uh, mostly about um, in upcoming meetings and a couple of notices that we think uh, people might be interested in uh, getting involved with. Uh, please write clearly so Rita can uh, put you on the mailing list. Um, okay, before we go any further, turn off your cell phones. All right. I'm going to do the same. Okay, just to be aware, the front door of the library is locked, so people have to come in the side doors. Um, you can come and go through those doors. The bathrooms are in the back. You go through that door and go to the left, and you'll find the uh, bathrooms. Um, there are lovely cookies in the back. And thank you, Rita Sullivan, again. She is wonderful. There's also some decaf coffee and some hot water for tea and hot chocolate if you want that. Um, the other thing is in the back table there, there's a lot of uh, information from the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility and Safe and Sane Skagit. Um, so please take anything that you would like. There's all kinds of wonderful information. Um, there's also voter registration forms. So even if you're registered but you know somebody who is not, or somebody who's moved to this area and hasn't switched out their new address, uh, please feel free to take uh, some forms for them. Um, the Fidelity Democrats are an independent democratic association with a focus on education. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are not a PAC. We cannot endorse candidates or contribute to their campaign. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up about uh, what's happening tonight. Um, we don't charge dues, um, but we pass the hat at some point. Sarah's going to pass a basket around. Um, we thank you for your contribution and support. Tonight, we're going to donate any money we collect to the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility and Safe and Sane Skagit. Um, if you want to donate more or want to donate differently, uh, they have websites and the information on that is on the back table. Um, just to give you an idea of what we do a little bit with some of the funds that we do collect, um, we recently donated to the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and the World Central Kitchen um, in support of those organizations. Um, we felt those were appropriate given what's going on with the politics right now. Um, we also volunteer at the Brick Dinner um, at the Presbyterian Church uh, once in a while throughout the year. The meeting is being recorded by Zane Butler and will be available on our YouTube channel in a few days. Um, Rita works with Zane to send it out. Uh, just be aware, the camera's back there. If you walk in front of it, you will be on the recording. So just be aware. Um, we often get a lot of views of our recordings, and um, you're welcome to share them. So thank you, Zane. Thank you, Rita, for doing that. Um, before we move on, our next meeting is Tuesday, February 6th. It'll be the first Tuesday of the month, because we couldn't get the library on the 2nd. Uh, the person who's going to be the main speaker is Reverend Terry Kylo. He um, is involved with an organization called Paths to Understanding. And he's an absolute delightful man and a wonderful speaker. 
and we'll send out the details and the information in another week or two. And before I introduce the speakers, um, I'm going to ask if there's any uh, elected officials, Democratic Party officials, including PCOs. If you are, please raise your hand and introduce yourself. Okay, Rita, I know you are. PCO, Scott. Okay, anybody else that I... PCOs. All right, Sarah, thank you, and Lynn, thank you. All right, and... Uh, Caleb is in the back, is from the Anacortes American in Skagit. Harold, thank you for coming. Good work, Anna. Yeah, you really have been a wonderful addition. So thank you. Um, and I just give a couple of uh, shout outs to a couple of people. Uh, Don Ambrose does the Skagit Democrats new newsletter. If you're interested in getting that, it's wonderful and filled with stuff. Just go on their website. Um, and then Carol and Rick Tam Tamler edit the Whitby Island newsletter. Um, and then Doreen Sadler, she does Facebook for us. So we do get uh, a lot of support, get extra uh, people out there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move along and we're going to introduce, I'm going to introduce all four speakers at the same time because they're going to take turns talking. And I will read their little blurbs and let them add to that if they would like to. Um, Hazel Brown, um, Hazel began her time with the Alliance for Gun Responsibility as a fellow during the 2019 electoral cycle. Since then, they have served in various policy and advocacy positions at the Alliance before moving into their current role as policy and advocacy manager. Um, they have also served in several research positions analyzing a variety of national issues. When not at the Alliance, Hazel can be found basking in the elusive Seattle sun or playing Frisbee. Alex Castro uh, joined the Alliance as a field organizer in December of 2022. She joins us after organizing for a congressional campaign in California's Central Valley. Alex's role with the Alliance prioritizes volunteer engagement and recruitment. When they aren't out in the field, you can find Alex exploring Seattle. So, I want to thank them both so much for driving up here. It's really wonderful because that's a long drive for them. We're so happy to be here. Thanks for having us, all of you. Right. So the next two folks are from Safe and Sane Skagit. Um, and, uh, is Julia Hurt is a lifelong volunteer for one organization or another. Uh, she became involved with that's her, what she said, so. <laughs> uh, she was involved with Safe and Sane Skagit from its inception at our first protest in October 2015. Uh, Julia, along with others, was disturbed by the ongoing gun violence in our society and what seemed to be a constant barrage of bad news with nothing being done about it. Um, believing Safe and Sane Skagit to be the best local means of working for change, she remained one of its core activists ever since. So, thank, you. thank you as well. Um, and with her today is Diane Studley, who has lived in Skagit County since 1975. She's a retired school district arts program coordinator, community activist, and grandmother with five grandchildren. She became politically active in 1971 um, when uh, she headed a common cause telephone tree and worked on the George McGovern campaign. She's involved with Safe and Sane Skagit in 2018 after the Parkland shooting. Like most of us, um, she felt helpless against gun violence and wanted to do something. Um, Julia asked her to succeed her 
as the chapter lead for their affiliation with the Alliance for Gun Responsibility in 2019. have, as you can see, four amazing people who have come up and done a lot. So I'm going to turn this over to them, let them uh, tell them a little bit about the organization, what we can do, and we'll go from there. Um, our mics are sketchy, um, so we have two. We'll start with this one. to inform us all. I think they do a really great service and I really appreciate what they do. Um, I also want to thank the Alliance, of course, because they are an absolutely astounding organization. I attribute the laws that have passed, the gun violence prevention laws in the state of Washington that have passed since um, 2012, since um, Sandy Hook, to the Alliance. They know what they're doing. They know how to mobilize volunteers and, and they do a great job and then lastly of course I want to um, recognize and schedule because they're a wonderful group of people to work with. Could you talk a little bit louder? Oh sure sorry. Okay. And you might want to move the mic in the, in, up more in that direction. Like this? Is that better? Uh, yeah. yeah. That is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I also want to recognize SAS, Safe and Seeing Skagit. They are an incredible, incredible group to work with, and um, and they're a dedicated group of volunteers. So it's really special. Um, and of course, I want to mention why we do what we do. It's the people that are affected by gun violence um, and, and all of the horrors that that are associated with that. And we have members in our um, in our group that have been affected, uh, including, for example, one woman who was uh, heavily affected in 2008, the mass shooting in Alger when uh, six people were killed and two people were injured, and. Um, uh, so that's one example. Um, she was involved in that. And then, of course, we had, uh, including one uh, Skagit County Sheriff's Deputy at that time. In 2016, of course, we had the tragic Cascade Mall shooting um, when five people were killed. And then I want to mention one gun shop, an uh, infamous gun shop in Skagit County that uh, the Seattle Times in 2013 called possibly the worst gun shop in the nation. Um, they uh, had a series of scandals. The ATF shut them down in 2012, and um, some of the things they did were, for example, uh, they didn't keep track of thousands of guns that went who knows where and were involved in crimes, and there was all sorts of other stories. So um, that's why we do what we do. Uh, Oh, I have one thing, a statistic I want to mention is, um, from what I understand, there are over 400 million guns in the U.S., and our population is about 332. Did I say 400 million guns and 332 million people in the U.S.? So, there you go. Um, and I want to just give a brief history of our groups, SAS. We, um, as Barbara said, started in October of 2015. Our chairperson and founder was driving through Oregon uh, when there was a mass shooting at Oakwa Community College. She drove home to Edison. There was a new gun shop there with a huge mural that had two assault rifles painted on the side. And she was so upset that she called a few people and we then subsequently um, painted signs and protested and started protesting around the county. We realized that just protesting the signs wasn't really going to accomplish a whole lot. And so um, that's when we, in 2017, hooked up with 
the Alliance, and uh, I've been ever since. And um, so we um, we started having regular meetings. We created a logo, a mission statement, had signs made, um, Facebook page, Gmail account. We have a, 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 a Google group list, and if anybody is interested in um, signing up, we don't send out a lot except during the legislative session. But um, if you're interested, you can sign up in the back. Um, so uh, in 2016, we worked um, with the Alliance on 14, uh, 91. That was extremist protection orders. We gathered signatures for that statewide initiative, and um, it passed 69% of the vote. And as I remember, 30. Eight of 39 counties voted in favor of it, which sent a strong message to our legislators. Because at the time, state legislators didn't want to touch any gun violence prevention laws, but that sent a pretty good message that um, people in the state of Washington really are interested in gun safety. Um, at the extreme risk protection orders um, it allows. Um, the guns to be taken away from people who are a threat to themselves or others, maybe by family members, by law enforcement, etc. And in 2017, we started lobbying in Olympia, uh, attending hearings, lobby days. Uh, some of our members have testified, contacting legislators, and in um, 2018 uh, was a pretty big year for us. Uh, well, it was a pretty big year nationwide. That's when. Um, Parkland happened, and it mobilized students all across the nation, including in Skagit County. Uh, there was a, a, a march that uh, March for Our Lives that the students organized from the high school, Mount Vernon High School, to the courthouse. Uh, every single high school in the county, except one, uh, walked out of classes. Uh, organizing, you know, rallies around around that Parkland shooting. Parkland, there were 17 people killed and 17 people injured, um, and it really, I think, was a watershed. Um, and gun violence was taken up by young people, you know, just really charging the nation, I think, and um, and making gun violence a public health issue as well. Um, that uh, also um, Safe and Safe Scanch at uh, that uh, put together a panel discussion uh, with some of the students and with the alliance with Moms Demand Action and there was a, a particular um, consulting organization that was advising schools on um, how to make them safer that that spoke as well um, and then also in 2018 was the third and the last initiative that the Alliance did, that was 1639 called Safe Schools, Safe Communities. Um, that was, at the time, the largest gun safety bill in the US. It had several components, including um, safe storage, uh, raising the age to purchase an assault weapon to 21 from 18, um, a waiting period, a training course, um, so it had a lot of components, and one special story that I can share about um, SAS is that at that time uh, we had one particular volunteer, Kathleen O'Grady, who um, gathered signatures for this ballot initiative uh, and at the ferries in Anacortes, and she gathered more signatures than any other volunteer in the state of Washington, 888 signatures, and was recognized for that. Um, and it passed with 60% of the vote. Uh, so again, people were ready for change. But also, because it was so comprehensive, there was a lot of pushback afterwards, uh, a lot of opposition to it after it passed. And um, just to name a few things that um, SAS has done uh, and continues to do, we table, we um, have put together two events in Edison called Seeds of Change. We uh, always participate, or pretty much always, in Wear Orange, which is a national day to recognize victims of gun violence. Um, 
we meet with legislators, and last year, um, Bill Johnson, he's right over there, he put together um, a website for us, finally, that was great. And um, last year, the big, big, big deal, took seven years, was the assault weapons ban passed in the state of Washington. And um, Gifford's Law Center rates every state uh, for their um, gun safety laws. And with the passage of that, we uh, got a name on this, joining 10 other states who have A's. So that was great. And um, we were thrilled to be in the gallery, in the Senate, some of us from SAS, when the Senate voted to pass that bill. So that was really exciting. It was great. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Diane Studley. She is our champion liaison between the Alliance and SAS and um, keeps us informed. And she will talk about that. Um, she also is a table captain. Uh, every year, the Alliance does a fundraising lunch, and that's their main fundraiser. And um, Diane is, uh, has volunteers to be our table captain for that since 2020 and manages to raise at least $5,000 or more from SAS for the Alliance. So thank you, Diane. Thank you, Julia. So Julie is why I'm here. Uh, you know, well, in 2018, after the Parkland shootings, I wondered what I could do, and so I uh, joined up with SAS. And then the next year, uh, Julie asked me if I would take over for her as the chapter lead, which we are a chapter of the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. And Alex arranges monthly meetings statewide with all the chapters, so we're able to keep in touch. And now the legislative season's starting. And so during the legislative season, um, once a week I send out a newsletter that says what happened in the, during the week and what's going to happen the next week and how we have to mobilize. There's always action alerts to um, write to your representatives and senators. And I mean, the 40th district is fabulous. I mean, you have wonderful uh, legislators in your district. Uh, we've got also in the um, uh, Skagit County, we have the 39th district, which is mine, which is very red. And we have the 10th district, which is purple. And so we still have a lot of work to do there. Uh, so every, the Alliance passes on information to me. I look up stuff in the Washington State website, which is a great if you ever want to look up any bills. but. The, the Alliance is just the premier uh, group in Washington that works for uh, gun violence prevention and works with all the legislators and organizes. And um, so we are thrilled that they are here today. Um, we do organize carpools for hearings and we um, do the uh, organizational work for letting you know what needs to be done that week as far as the legislature is concerned. So I don't want to talk anymore because we've got these great women here that are staff at the um, Alliance and they, um, we couldn't have better people here. If you want to know about organizing, Alex has the answers. If, Hazel is a policy wonk. You can ask her anything. <laughs> She's got it on the tips of the finger, her fingers. One thing I would like to say, because the Fidalgo Democrats, they know signs. I mean, they rally one all the time. Is it once a week or once a month? <laughs> it seems like the Fidalgo Democrats are always out there with their signs. And um, two days ago, I was getting my sign ready to go to the Planned Parenthood rally. And I'm looking through my signs, and I had a sign that said, uh, ban assault weapons now. And I thought, gee, I don't have to carry that sign anymore. <laughs> so if you're wondering what the Alliance does and how good it can make you feel to support them, then, you know, my sign story is a good one, I think. <laughs> so OK, Alex, say so. Thank you both so much. Can we get another round of applause for them? <laughs> Can you all hear me if I hold the microphone like this? Yeah. Great. Um, 
I really feel like it's important to highlight volunteers in this movement especially because um, as Diane mentioned, we're paid to do this. We're extremely lucky to get to have this be our job and to get to do a lot of things that we really care about and to be involved in this issue day in and day out. But so many folks who help make this work possible um, are not professionals. They are folks just like everyone else in this room but who are human beings who recognize that there's a problem and that you know we are we need to mobilize and come together in order to see any real change in our state and in our country. Um, so, as has been introduced, uh, my name is Hazel. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager with the Alliance. I've been with the Alliance for a little over four years now, doing a variety of different uh, work relating to advocacy, relating to fundraising, relating to policy, uh, and now I'm in the fortunate position where I get to kind of um, sit in a lot of different places in the organization um, and so I get to speak to a lot of different things. So I'm really happy to be with he be here with you all today um, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Alex. Hello, my name is Alex. Um, I'm the field organizer at the Alliance. I've been here for just a little over a year um, and also want to shout out Safe and Sane Skagit. If you haven't already, sign up for their fabulous newsletters. They're amazing, they're beautiful, they're informative, organized, so please sign up for them if you haven't already. Um, I, while Diane was talking and she talked about Park, Parkland, um, I recognized that one of my first ever types of advocacy in gun violence prevention was uh, participating in a walkout my senior year of high school because that's when Parkland happened. And um, being a high school student and uh, witnessing on TV what was happening um, was really hit close to home. Um, I can remember being in middle school when Sandy Hook happened um, and coming in after lunch uh, to my math class. Um, so um, I would just like to see a world where less kids have to, their memories are filled with school shootings um, and I hope that their memories are still instead filled with um, happy memories of childhood. Um, so yeah. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to have a section where Hazel will be going over uh, some of our policy that will be um, supporting this legislative session. We'll leave some room open for open for, we'll leave some room open for questions. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and also, just want to let you know that this photo is back from 2020 or 2019 um, at the state capitol um, pre-COVID. <laughs> So the Alliance is made up of, of three different um, organizations. We have the C4. The C4 is advocacy. So during legislative session, that is entirely what we are doing. We are asking our volunteers to reach out to legislators and let them know that they care about gun violence prevention. Um, and so essentially, the entire next two months will be advocacy. The C3 is implementation. So after passing those laws, after the advocacy, we want to see how can we make sure that the laws that we just passed are one, able to be, able to be enforced by law enforcement um, and just be utilized well. Um, next we have research, so that's pulling data. Um, Giffords is a really great uh, research um, ally in the gun violence prevention movement. Um, so we do look to them. Uh, we also do conduct some of our own research. And public education. This is exactly what we're doing right now. This is public education. Um, public education can also look like um, attending county fairs or um, speaking at schools or churches and informing people about what we do, but also how to stay safe when it comes to um, owning a firearm. With rights comes responsibility. And lastly, we have the PAC. That's political giving. So during the, during the electoral season, um, we endorse candidates who are great gun violence prevention advocates and who we trust will um, carry the movement in the legislature, in school boards, in our city councils. Um, so yeah, really exciting. And uh, Safe and Sane's gadget covered this little piece, is lobbying and public education and doing work like this. 
So we started off with um, Initiative 594, which was a lot of back, it was um, working to help close the background check loophole that still exists federally. Um, there was a ton of interest around this, um, and this ended up being our first major victory. And what really ended up proving that you know we had staying power politically. We were then able to move on to Initiative 9, uh, 1491, which was the Extreme Risk Protection Order Initiative that Julia mentioned. Um, and again, this really showed overwhelming support throughout our state for gun violence prevention policies. Starting in around 2016, when 1491 got passed, that's when we start seeing a lot of bills passing through our state legislature, which is, again, really incredible. Um, if you had taken um, some of the bills that we passed recently, such as our assault weapons ban, such as our mandatory training, um, mandatory training requirements and waiting periods in order to purchase a firearm, um, that would not have even been heard of in the legislature in 2012, in 2014. But as we started to prove time and time again that there was a strong public interest for all of these policies, um, legislators began to take us seriously because the public already was. So our last ballot initiative, and hopefully it remains our last, um, is Initiative 1639, which again was really sweeping. It did a ton to help prevent gun violence in our communities. It did strengthen, um, it did strength, strengthen um, buying firearms and, and set up waiting periods. It uh, really increased safe storage requirements in our state um, and really just helped kind of meet the need that was, um, that was the intense desire by so many people to do things in the wake of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Um, we then have now mostly turned to doing advocacy at the Washington State Legislature. Um, thankfully, they take us seriously now um, and, in fact, even get excited to support our bills, which is really great. Um, and we love working with the Washington State Legislature. So that's a little bit about our ballot initiatives. And um, the Alliance over the years after the ballot initiatives has passed um, just over 55 bills. Um, so we've done a lot of great work in our advocacy space um, and building those relationships not only with our volunteers, um, but with our supporters and our partners. We've also endorsed more than 300 candidates. Um, we had only nine endorsed candidates in 2014. People were actually afraid to um, work with us, uh, they were afraid to speak up about um, gun violence prevention, um, and in 2022, we've had at least 84 endorsed candidates. So we've really grown, we've grown um, to gain the trust of our legislators and of their constituents. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of amazing work. And I'm gonna pass it right off to Hazel. Um, I'm also gonna pass around a sign-in sheet. If you're interested in our organization and you're not already involved, Please sign up uh, if you would like to sign up to volunteer, to testify, to be an Olympia. Um, please do, and I will get back to you. Yeah, so um, as I think most of you already know, we this week started the 2024 legislative session in our state, um, and that will run until March 7th. So that means that you know Alex and I are consistently working for the next couple months to make sure that these laws um, end up, or these bills end up becoming law. So I'm just gonna go over these briefly, um, and then there will be time for a couple questions. We definitely don't want this to be um, the bulk of the presentation, uh, but I think it's really important to spotlight the work that we're doing and how we're trying to continue to move the needle forward. Um, and then as mentioned, I think my email will be shared as well. So if there are any specific policy questions, um, we'll definitely feel free to pull me aside afterwards or um, you know I can give you my business card or whatever we will connect um, so briefly the Washington legislative uh, the Washington legislature works on a biennium meaning that every two years all bills um, all bills die and need to be reintroduced we are on the second half of that biennium meaning that we have a couple bills that still exist that were introduced last year. So these bills have already gotten hearings, they've already kind of 
moved some of the way through the process, but they are, but they still haven't become law yet. They still haven't, you know, gone all the way. So we're still really advocating for these. The first one is a restoration of local authority. In Washington state, we have a preemption law in place. And what that means is that local governments are not able to regulate uh, firearms in the way that they're able to regulate a variety of other things. And we've gotten uh, requests from a ton of different cities, counties, um, especially in the wake of every you know kind of really public tragedy that we see. Um, my inbox, my boss's inbox, my, CE, my CEO's inbox blows up with local elected officials asking me what they can do in order to help prevent gun violence in their communities as a leader. And, you know, their options, while not, you know, absent, are severely limited. And there's a ton of things that they want to be able to do at the local level uh, that would allow them to help regulate their communities in the way that, you know, they see their communities needing to be regulated. So that's one of our top issue areas that we're really excited to continue pushing. Um, that's sponsored by Senator Nguyen in the Senate and Representative Hackney in the House. Um, we also have uh, risk-based restrictions for sensitive places. So locations such as public parks, museum, museums, aquariums, zoos, places where children are really likely to be present. Um, we're not seeing that these locations have the ability to say that they can't have firearms on the premises if they are publicly owned. So we need to go through the legislature to make sure that, you know, um, the Seattle Aquarium has reached out to us specifically asking that this policy exist because they recognize that they don't want firearms in their establishment, yet they can't um, they can't facilitate that process themselves just due to bureaucratic red tape. So we're really excited to continue to advocate for this bill on their behalf and a couple other organizations at the you know local levels. Moving on to new bills and um, something to think about as well as you know we've talked a little bit about some of the victories that we've had, but. Washington State at this point is at an A minus, according to Giffords, um, and the only state that is an A is California. So we're doing pretty well. Um, so we've got, had the opportunity now to really think about what innovative policies can we introduce. What have we seen happen at you know potentially a smaller level or only in a couple states that we think can really make a difference in Washington. Um, and what can we help spotlight and what can we help pilot to, you know, continue to address the epidemic of gun violence that we face in our country. So first and foremost, we are introducing a permit to purchase bill um, that's going to be sponsored by Representative Barry in the House and Senator Elias in the Senate. Um, and this would basically just require there to be a permit to purchase a firearm in our state, um, the same way that you need a license to drive a car. Um, it would be renewed every five years um, for a nominal fee, but all it really does is just make sure that we have a more robust background check behind the firearms that are purchased in our state. It would require fingerprints, it would require Washington State Patrol to do a more in-depth background check, um, so we're really excited to see this passed. Uh, we think that this is going to be a really effective policy moving forward. Um, all data have shown that states that implement a permit to purchase system see huge reductions in both suicides and homicides. We also are going to be introducing mandatory reporting of lost and stolen firearms. This is something that, you know, currently in our state, it's not, you're not required to report any firearm um, once you notice it's missing, you're not required to report that that firearm is missing. And what that ends up doing is, you know, that doesn't set law enforcement up for success at all when they are doing the work that they need to do. We see that um, when folks aren't adequately communicating with police, that um, individuals will get, um, if your firearm is recovered at the scene of a crime, an individual will potentially be um, brought in for questioning or held liable for that crime. Um, we see that um, officers, if they are not sure whether or not an individual owns the firearm or not, if it's not in that lost or stolen registry, 
you know, you were not able to adequately trace where it's going or where it's been. So this is just really a tool to help our law enforcement officials be able to more accurately help protect the communities that they're already working with. We're then going to be introducing a dealer accountability bill. And what this bill will do will basically just create a code of conduct for firearms dealers in our state. And it's a ton of things that firearm dealers are, for the most part, already doing. Things like adequate security, things like safely storing their merchandise, things like reporting when their merchandise gets lost or stolen. Um, but as Julia, again, beautifully teed up for me, um, every once in a while we do see that there are some um, firearms dealers that fall through the cracks and that really aren't meeting standards for the merchandise that they are selling. So this again just really helps us um, make sure that everyone is on the same page when it comes to interacting with handling and transferring these really dangerous um, items. We're also going to be introducing a uh, bold weapons purchase prohibition. So um, we know that bold weapons purchases are the biggest indicator of firearms trafficking that we can get in our state. So um, over half of crime guns that are received, we know were purchased in a bulk weapons um, transaction. So a transaction that was, you know, over five firearms. What that means is that, you know, in our state, we are now introducing this bill that will say that you can only buy one firearm every 30 days. Um, this may change over the course of debate and over the course of the legislative process, but by limiting the amount of firearms that an individual can purchase at any given time, this really just mitigates the likelihood that there are straw purchase there there is straw purchasing happening um, in our state, so that we're not seeing folks buy an inordinate number of firearms and then transfer them without any background checks or anything to you know individuals who shouldn't be owning firearms in the first place. And then we're going to be introducing a bill that would direct the healthcare authority to um, allow Medicaid reimbursement for hospital violence intervention programs. And these programs really just work to reduce recidivism for especially young people who come in with violent wounds into hospitals and really be able to, you know, have someone show up at, at that individual's, you know, bedside and say, hey, talk to me. What happened? How did we get here? What, what, what happened to have this conflict? Um, and how can we get you out of a potentially dangerous situation? Currently, the only place that has um, hospital violence intervention programs in our state is Harborview, and they end up paying for that service out of you know, Harbor, Harborview's own funds. So if we can help make these tools more readily accessible through Medicaid, um, I think we'll be able to see, and data has shown that we will see, um, lower recidivism, especially for our young people who are being brought in due to um, traumatic injuries. Then we'll be introducing a bill that will allow Washington State Patrol to destroy firearms that they end up confiscating or receiving. Currently, just due to kind of a weird loophole, Washington State Patrol isn't able to destroy the firearms that uh, they collect over the course of their duties. Um, and this is just, you know, every, every local uh, police department has the ability, if they want to, to destroy confiscated firearms. So that just, you know, we're just helping kind of level the playing field. Uh, they want this bill. It should hopefully be a pretty light lift comparatively. Um, and then lastly, we're going to be introducing a bill that will cover um, civil liability insurance for those that own firearms. Um, now, when we're talking about innovative policies, this is one that I get really excited about. Um, this really hasn't been seen at a statewide level yet. We would be the first state to pass it if, it if it moved forward. And the only other place that has done something like this is San Jose, California. So we're going to have a lot of learning to do. We're really excited to introduce this bill and continue to move the needle forward as a state. Um, but basically, this would just, again, very similar to a car, um, state, hey, if you own a dangerous weapon that can cause harm, you need to make sure that you're prepared if this weapon does cause harm for, for covering damages related to that harm. Okay, um, I did my best. That probably still was a little too lengthy. Um, but would love to open it up if there are any questions. Um, and if not, then we can keep moving forward. 
How would the civil liability insurance thing work with guns without serial numbers? That's a great question. Um, in our state, a firearm without a serial number is a legal period. So um, that means that then, if you were trying to insure an illegal firearm, um, I'm sure that would become very challenging. I haven't looked, I haven't looked into the nuances of that yet. Um, and there probably are exceptions for you know collectors items, um, and collectors firearms. Especially, we really try to work with folks who collect firearms as a hobby um, to make sure that they are um, able to continue pursuing their hobby. But the, but yeah, I suppose that's my answer to your question. That's good. I do my best. <laughs> If you have any questions, I'll bring the uh, microphone to you, you so, so we can hear what you have to say. I have a question. Um, okay, you want to speak into the mic? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like individuals who have guns are very concerned when they see an organization like yours that you're going to take away their guns. Uh, this is the... Uh, get right down to the people who actually vote and can uh, establish policies uh, legally. And uh, so my question for you is, um, could you define for us what a responsible gun owner is or looks like or does? Yeah, absolutely. And this, um, we will have a more generic Q&A at the end. So if they're, um, so happy to engage with this, but, um, would recommend policy questions for now. But when I'm thinking about what a what a responsible gun owner looks like, and of course, this can look a variety of different ways. Um, I grew up in rural Wisconsin, and so I grew up with firearms in my home because um, my family was worried about uh, whether or not, you know, if someone came up our half mile long driveway, right, like that meant that if, if we didn't know who it was, that meant probably trouble and we didn't want him there. So with all of that being said, safe storage is um, pretty critical. If you are a firearm owner, um, you know, your firearm, one, in Washington State should be safely secured, period. But just as a, as a human being, um, we know that having a firearm in your home, especially if it is easily accessible, you are more likely to die from that firearm than you are to defend yourself from it. And that doesn't mean that there will never be an instance where you will need to use your firearm or that it is, you know, or that it's not reasonable for you to want a firearm for self-defense, but that firearm needs to be, you know, not locked and loaded on your bedside table. Um, storing your ammunition separately from your firearm. Um, really, common sense measures like that have been found to really reduce, um, have been found to really reduce accidental, accidental fatalities, etc. Um, but I do really caution against, you know, this this idea that there can be like one perfect type of gun owner, right? Because there are, gun owners look a variety of different ways and there's a ton of different reasons why someone may choose to own a firearm. Um, someone owning a firearm for self-defense, the way that they interact with their firearm will look very different than someone who, you know, shoots for sport or someone who hunts. So um, there's no, that's kind of a cop-out answer of like there's no perfect way, but um, the main thing that I will indicate if you are a gun owner is really emphasizing safe storage regardless of the why of, you know, you owning the firearm, um, making sure that it is accessible uh, by you and only by you um, is pretty critical. I have two questions. I have two questions. One, um, it seems like I recall Senator Lovick introduced the um, confiscated firearm bill before, mm -hmm. and it did not pass. Mm -hmm. Could you give us um, a background on why? Yeah, that's a great question. So that was before my time. It was introduced in 2018, 
And um, it was also, unfortunately, before my direct supervisor's time. So um, we, whenever we've been kind of scheming, haven't really gotten that answer from, um, from folks that have worked in the policy space for longer than us yet. Um, but my gut says that, you know, it probably just ran out of time. And, you know, something to keep in mind here is we have a really ambitious policy agenda. This is a lot of new bills to have introduced for a short session. We have 60 days to pass all of this policy, and that 60 days is including weekends. So um, if we are not consistently putting our you know, foot on the gas to really say, hey, you need to pay attention to this bill, it probably won't get paid attention to. So um, my gut says we probably just ran out of time um, and that there was you know, um, competing priorities and it just ended up, you know, like uh, unfortunately, like some of our bills from last year, just like end up not being able to cross the finish line because time is so limited during legislative session. Well, that leads to my second question. Do you have bipartisan sponsorship on any of these bills? Not at the moment, no. We, um, when working with Representative Orwall um, and with uh, Representative Sen on both Medicaid reimbursement for hospital violence intervention programs and for the mandated Washington State Patrol to destroy confiscated firearms. Um, we have seen bipartisan support in other states. Um, we were optimistic that we would get bipartisan support, um, and I think we're still asking for sign-ons, but I wouldn't count on it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we, we are a bipartisan or nonpartisan um, organization and we really strive to continue to just really champion that you know us as an organization we really focus on balancing rights with responsibilities we know and understand and believe in the second amendment and also know that these are very dangerous and need to you know firearms are very dangerous and needed to be treat, treated with a lot of responsibility however um even though we are a nonpartisan organization, uh, the work we do ends up really aligning with one side of the political spectrum and not the other. Okay, let me. Okay, let me. I'm a happy car owner. Um, I wouldn't dream of driving without car insurance. And I think that the civil liability insurance probably also is a relief to many gun owners. At the same time, I think many will wonder how much will it cost? Can you give us an idea? That's such a good question. I don't know the answer to that yet. Again, this is a very, this is a very new idea. And so the way that this has been drafted currently is um, a tying it in with homeowners insurance. So because there's no existing, there's not an existing independent insurance market for firearms in the way that there's insurance markets for homes or for cars. Um, so it's not like we can get in, in, it's not feasible to work with insurance companies to set up an entirely new avenue of insurance policy <coughs> in such a limited amount of time. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but that's probably something that I'm going to need to know the answer to very soon. Um, for those of you that can't tell, this is the start of legislative sessions, so I'm still warming up all of my topic points. <laughs> Since you're only going to get one or two of those passed in a 60-day session, which one should we prioritize? What a great question. So, what I will say is last short session, we were able to pass eight or nine bills, one of which was our um, high capacity magazine restriction. So we continue to defy even our own expectations. So I really hesitate to, you know, say one, one or two bills is worth more time than the others. What I will, what I will highlight is that when it comes to making sure that these bills get airtime, um, one thing that really matters is having folks that support these policies show up more than folks that oppose these policies. Legislators listen, they do. They count the amount of emails that they get for and against a policy. And their staff make sure to let them know how many constituents 
want them to support versus oppose a certain policy. So, with that being said, uh, we are already seeing pushback on permit to purchase, lost and stolen firearms, dealer accountability, and our bulk weapons purchases. And I think that these four are going to be the ones to, you know, really show up for this year. I think that we're seeing, you know, and again, with all of these bills, they are all important. They all are really exciting. But the ones that are really, the ones that are going to be the majority of our time talking about fighting for, lobbying for, are going to be the ones that our opposition also ends up talking, you know, and fighting and lobbying for. So, um, with that being said, I would really emphasize permit to purchase, reporting of lost and stolen firearms, dealer accountability, and that bulk weapons purchases bill. What a great question, thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one more question here in the policy section before moving on to the rest of the presentation. Or we can just be done. Incredible. Okay, thank you all so much. And we'll um, continue to think through questions and we'll have another chance for questions at the end here. All right, so we just talked about a whole bunch of policy jargon. Thank you so much, Hazel. Um, now we're gonna to get to the advocacy part. So this is how we get legislation passed, such as assault weapons ban or high capacity magazines. It starts here. Um, so the Alliance will not be hosting a lobby day this year. Basically what a lobby day is, is um, supporters for a particular issue um, show up at the Capitol and we get to meet up with legislators and um, advocate for these policies, so letting them know why we care about them, why we need them to pass and vote yes on these bills. Um, so we won't be having a lobby day, however, we will be supporting Moms Against Gun Violence, Grandmothers, and Washington Youth Alliance um, for their lobby days. And it's really important that we also support these other organizations in our state um, doing the important work, because we cannot do this alone. We need to work with our partners. Um, so it's really important to show up for them as well. The best way to show support for gun violence prevention legislation will be to attend the Alliance's major hearing and gallery days. Unfortunately, we don't have any solid dates. That's the nature of um, legislative session. Um, but a hearing is when um, the bill enters committee and the committee will talk about that bill and address the bill, hear testimony. Um, so, uh, so when that comes up, what we do is I um, send out an email, you'll get tons of calls from me, our interns, our fellows, um, asking you to show up in Olympia wearing orange um, and trying everything we can to get you there. A gallery day is um, when that bill finally gets to the floor and legislators are voting on that bill, making amendments to that bill. Um, we sit right above the legislators, wearing orange, letting them know that we're here, we care, and um, we need them to listen to, to what we got to say. Um, we also have the opportunity for our volunteers to give us permission to sign them in as pro for different gun violence prevention legislation. What this is, is there is um, a section on the, leg on, the, on the legislator website where um, a couple of uh, 24 hours to the hearing or whenever the hearing is announced, there are so many hours to sign in on each bill, letting and the, those are um, those committee members can see that see those signs and they know this so many people voted yes, this so many people vote no that we shouldn't pass these bills. So it's more of an encouragement mechanism and. Um, on that link right down there where it says here in blue, um, you can um, sign into that Google form and allow us to sign you in. Um, only if you allow us to sign you in will we do it, and um, it just makes it a lot easier for you. We won't have to give you a call every time we need you to sign in. We do it for you automatically. So if you want to utilize this, please do. You can also submit written testimony to voice your support to legislators, um, and you can also do this on the same website for each bill. And just note that for all bills, the opportunity to provide written testimony will close 24 hours after the start time of the hearing. So if you're interested in that, um, just, stay, um, just uh, make sure to do it 24 hours prior, um, leading up. And here is the QR code to sign up for the consent list. So if you're interested right now, you know for sure you would like us to sign you in. 
uh, go ahead, pull your phones out, um, and you can hover over this QR code here, and it will allow you. It'll take you to this Google form and allow you to sign up for um, us to sign you in, basically, from the consent list. Mm -hmm. I signed up last year. Is that still good this year? I got to do it again. You got to do it again every year. We we ask for your consent again. So. Um, I will leave this up for a couple um, minutes at the end. I'll come back to this. Well, an another way to get involved is to write a letter to the editor in support of gun violence prevention legislation. Um, our new communications director, Abdirman, uh, you can connect to him through us. If you send us an email and you would like to um, write a letter to the editor, please do. You can follow the Alliance's legislative headquarters on that link there. Um, and the, the headquarters include the policy agenda, our scorecard, um, a breakdown of the bills, so it gives you links to the bills, um, and just staying in touch with legislative session. During legislative session, there's also going to be a chance to talk to your legislators at town halls. Um, if you're able to make it, please wear either your mom's merchandise, your grandmother's merchandise, your alliance merchandise, wearing orange. Um, and show up and show your legislators that um, gun violence prevention is not going anywhere and we're here to stay and um, let them know that you need them to vote for yes on certain bills or um, even a great way to just get in touch with your legislators, get some face time with your legislators, get to know your legislators, it's really important. Make sure that you're also receiving emails from info at wildgunresponsibility.org. It's the quickest way um, to get information um, about hearing days, about gallery days, um, we know these can be a lot, but it's really, really important to pay attention to them. Um, they will send out emails as soon as we get our dates, and they're very rapid, a lot of whiplash. Um, and we also um, have a text sign-up. So if you text AGR to 40649, um, you can get text updates. And I'm going to take it right back over here. Um, I also want to let you know that maybe five minutes after this I'm going to switch it down. If you would like to make a donation, um, I'm going to pass around this folder. You can submit a check. Um, up to you. If you would like to submit something online, feel free to scan this QR code. Um, here are our emails. But I'm going to put it back here and I'll, um, I'll switch it back to the donation QR code as soon as um, the next five minute passes, but we are going to leave the floor open for questions now. Okay, does anyone have any uh, any more questions they would like to ask? Okay, hold on. Three out of four of the speakers use the term assault weapon. Is there a definition for that that's in some of these bills or in provide that for me thank you yeah absolutely so in Washington state we have banned assault weapons and we did that uh, both by outlining a list of make and models of firearms that are generically classified as assault weapons because um, you know there is there has been ambiguity on the term um, but the we also in our state outlined just certain certain components of a firearm that would make it an assault weapon. So I'm um, happy, to, happy to get more in the nitty gritty um, either you know, now or later, but, the, but yeah, there's both um, in Washington state a list of firearms that are identified as assault weapons or if you know, a firearm has a lot of components that end up making it like an assault weapon, then um, it is classified as an assault weapon in our state. That did cut cut as a definition, can, what are components, I'm gonna, there's got to be something that generically would describe it as a, an assault weapon. And that should be something you should easily be able to tell us. Yeah, so in general, um, an assault weapon is classified as a weapon that can fire many rounds repeatedly, um, and it does so at a really high velocity. Um, but again, that, you know, those definitions do vary depending on the state. So. Yeah, I just 
Are, are there any other questions that you would like to ask any of the people? Here you go. If you don't know off the top of your head, I understand, but um, the legislation that was enacted that has that listing, um, can you give a citation on the, you know, what that bill number, not what, what, what the uh, law number is? Do you know it off the top of your head? If you don't. Yeah, I know the bill number. I don't know what RCW it is, okay. but that was HB 1240 that passed last year. Got it. Um, so yeah, so that should have that list available. Thank you. Of course. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? You can also ask the folks from uh, Safe and Sane Skagit if you'd like to ask them a question as well. Okay. Um, also would like to see any merchandise or even learning more about our organization or how to prevent gun violence. Um, we have some information, some merchandise back there. Please feel free to take as many as you'd like. Um, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having us. Julia, Barbara, Diane, thank you for connecting us and allowing us to be here tonight. And um, yeah. Yeah, super happy to be here and share space with all of you. Um, please come up, chat with us. Um, and you know, I'm going to get a little bit more coffee. So um, I'll be around for a little bit. Um, I'd like to really thank, um, thank you all for coming up, and all of you from Safe and Sane Skagit as well, driving here. Um, it was not a lovely evening, to say the least, so thank you all for coming. Um, especially uh, Hazel Brown, Alex Castro, Julie Hurt, and Diana Studley. Um, and thank for you for all the work that you're doing. It's really very much appreciated. Um, and one other thing just to mention, uh, it was mentioned on Sunday from 12 to 1 at 12th and Commercial, we have various uh, people come with different kinds of interests and signs. So you're more than welcome to come if you find that interesting. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for coming and taking the time out of their busy schedules and being here. Really very much appreciated. And thank you, Cal, for coming as well. So if you want to stay, there's still some cookies in the back and some coffee and it's decaf, so you're safe. Thank you. I think the coffee is gone. The coffee is gone. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay.